Thank you for joining us for Home Landscape Design. This uh, presentation is sponsored by Tarrant Regional Water District and the City of Arlington Water Utilities and the City of Mansfield Water Utilities. And so before we get started with the presentation, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping and um, tell you about some opportunities that we have and a little bit um, more information about how you can interact with our webinar today. All right, so before we start the presentation, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Tarrant Regional Water District. Like I said, this presentation is sponsored by Tarrant Regional Water District. And so what TRWD does is that um, they provide the infrastructure and maintain the reservoirs that are needed to provide raw surface water um, to our local water treatment plants. And so our cities then treat that water at their um, water treatment plants to drinking water standards. And then those cities provide that to our homes and businesses. And the reason why TRWD might care about um, water conservation or doing a home landscape design class for you is that water conservation is a really important supply uh, water supply strategy so that we can continue to provide ample water for um, everyone in the future and for our growing population here in Tarrant County. And so um, our water conservation facing website is savetarrantwater.com and you can go there to um, see all of our water conservation resources and landscaping resources that we have. So we have free weekly watering advice that you can sign up to that is custom to your location. You can also sign up for a free sprinkler evaluation if you're a Tarrant County resident where a, a licensed irrigator will come to your house and take a look at your sprinkler system and let you know if there are any inefficiencies and, and how much water you're using whenever you run that sprinkler system. We also have a calendar of events and classes just like this one and then lots of water saving tips and videos. And um, another thing that we do in order to provide you with some of these um, interesting uh, presentations is that we partner with other organizations such as the Tarrant County Master Gardener and um, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. And so I believe that is all that I have to say. So I'm gonna finally introduce our speaker. Her, like I said, her name is Linda Hawkins, and I'm going to go ahead and um, give her the control so that she can start her home landscape design presentation. All right, then I'm going to go ahead and go away and you can start your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Don't really want to see me. Hello, everybody. I am very excited to be here. Um, Landscaping is what I do. It's what I love. And more, th more than anything, I like to teach people about how to landscape properly. Um, it's not just putting out plants and hoping that they'll grow properly. It's, it's a whole lot of thought processes going in. Um, you can choose to have your, your own yard landscape um, by a professional or you can choose to do it yourself. And it's okay to do it yourself. It, there really is really not anything wrong with doing yourself. It's just really important that you understand the steps that are involved in landscaping. Um, and today, we're gonna really focus on water conservation. In just so few years, we're gonna run out of water if we don't take care of what we have now. So with a little help from us, from um, from everybody around doing their part, we'll get this figured out. So what we have is um, water-wise landscaping. Why water is limited and fragile resource. Um, water, con um, water conservation doesn't mean cactus and rock gardens. A lot of times people say, well, I want a xeriscape, but I want, don't want it just to be like yuccas and agaves. I want flowers and stuff. Um, and that's what you should have. There's no reason to have just cactus and just rock. This isn't Las Vegas. I mean, we don't need the rock mulch um, and we can do it. You can use it, definitely can use it, but you you also can just use regular mulch because there's m so many benefits of using mulch on your soil. But basically we're gonna talk about common sense landscaping to protect our water quality and water quantity. Uh, the three greatest environmental challenges facing American landscapes are um, the irrigate, you know, to conserve irrigation water. Uh, we don't want people just watering anytime they feel like it. There are certain times that's better to water. There are certain ways that it's better to water. Um, we also want people to understand that whatever they put in their soil, the water will actually leach that out into the sewer systems, and that 
hurts the quality of our water. We also um, want to be careful of the use of pesticides. That also goes into our water systems. And some of that is really hard to clear out. So we really want to make sure that we pay attention to what we're doing on our own yards. So there's seven basics um, of a landscape design for a new home. When you're talking about water conservation, especially, you have your planning design, your soil analysis, your appropriate plant selections, your practical turf areas, efficient irrigation, the use of mulches, and the appropriate maintenance. Every one of these is an important step to have a successful design. Um, a lot of times people will leave out, unfortunately, these last three areas. And when that happens, your landscape isn't complete and you will find that you'll have a lot of issues with it. So it's really important to incorporate all these areas into your landscape. Notice something here. It was exact same thing it looks like that I just showed you, but this is the same thing we do for um, a older home. So the first, the previous one was for a new home and this is for an older home. So if you're redoing your landscape, especially after the freeze we had, there's great opportunity for a lot of us to reevaluate what we have and what we need to use again. You know, what worked, what doesn't work, what died, um, what didn't die. And like, what's in front of my windows? What am I looking at? But this, and this is a great time to take a look at all that. So how do we do it? First thing you want to do is get a base map of your yard. Um, you can get a plat survey, and if you don't have one, you can get one. Um, I think the Tarrant um, Appraisal District has a copy of one that you can download, or you can, for a small fee, go get a copy of it. It's really easy to start with that. Or if you want, you can just um, draw one out. So the thing you want to do is you want to have research and preparation. You need to be prepared. Um, the base map preparation, you know, call ahead, get a copy of it. Um, then you want to do a site inventory and analysis. Uh, and then I'll go a little bit more into that in a bit. Client analysis. It's really like analysis of what you want and what you need. Um, and then program development. Like how are you going to go about having this, this put in? And those are the, that's what we're going to do for our research and prep. So the design process, um, it is a series of problem solving and creative steps to develop an appropriate design solution. What your neighbor has work, might work for your neighbor, but it might not work best for the way your house is set up. However, something you can find out from neighbors is what things have worked well for them. And now, especially, walk around your neighborhood or drive around different neighborhoods. Try not to be too creepy about it, but um, just walk around and see what you like about different neighborhoods. And, you know, either jot it down, take a quick picture, you know, what is it you liked about that um, particular landscape? And this is, you know, kind of behind the scenes, um, you know, preparation, like what type of plants do you like? What, um, what is it about you? What is it about that plant that you like? So, and another way you can do that is you can look um, on different websites. You can look under um, Hows or you can look under um, Houses, H-O-U-Z-Z, -Z, and there's different places that you can go. Um, so all this stuff together helps design, um, it helps organize your information and thoughts. So a truly great landscape designs are just, um, all this behind the scenes work put together and you know you can use like I said designs like ideas from your neighbors ideas from like um, sites like cows or even just google images you know all these things brought together helped you develop your design and then once you figure out plants you like make sure you research them make sure you find out what's good and bad for, of those particular plants um, like for example you know, is it an adapted plant or is it a native plant? And if you have an adapted plant, is it a chance that it can get out of captivity? Like, I mean, does it, you know, will the neighbors start growing this plant? So those are the kind of things that you want to think about. Um, here, these next three slides are about food for thought, meaning these are the kind of things you need to think of. But one of the handouts that um, Heather will be sending you, it will have all this information on it. So you don't have to, you know, jot this all down but these are just things that you need to think about when you are you know planning your design like 
do I, you know, how do I want my front door um, shown? How is my entryway going to be, which is the most important part. It's how is it going to be um, made to look as important as it is? Because remember, when you're landscaping, um, you're actually supposed to be enhancing the house. Your house, you paid a lot of money for it, and you want to um, make the architecture of the house stand out. It's not about like what landscape mulch you use or what landscape um, you know plants you're using. I mean, it is, but it's really about enhancing the house because that's where the money is. That's where all your money is. But a landscape also can take away from the value of your home. So if you have a landscape that covers up all your windows, um, you know, or if it's half dead, that kind of landscape just takes away from the value of your home. But if everything is put in there with, with the thought of enhancing the living space, then it's a landscape that will definitely enhance the value of your home. Um, these are just a couple more, you know, what are you going to do in the future with it? If you're not doing it all right now, are you going to have a pool? Um, what about if you have children? If, you know, how are the children going to be able to use the yard? Um, so, if, if, you know, if you want a lawn, is there a good space for full sun? Because sometimes lawns, people will try to have a lawn underneath big, large trees, and lawns need at least, at the least, four hours of sunlight a day. And, you know, if you're not getting four hours of sunlight, there's no lawn, there's no grass, no matter what the commercials say, there is no grass that will grow in that area. So, what I'm, what I, um, you'll be receiving are two questionnaires. One is for a site analysis and one's like a landscape checklist. The site analysis is basically about the, um, the physical properties of the, of the um, land that you're going to be landscaping. Um, it talks about drainage, topography, things like that. And your landscape checklist is more about your needs and wants. What, you know, what is it you want your landscape to accomplish? Like, do you want um, a shady area? Do you want an area that um, you can have guests over? Things like that. So if we go back to the list of what we, um, we're talking about, the first thing we want to do um, is look at our soil. The soil is the most important part of, um, it's, it's the most important you know, part of your landscape. If you don't have good soil, then no matter what you do, it's not going to work. So, so it is the engine of the garden and should be treated as a resource. So, you know, um, no matter what soil you're starting with, the proper amendments, the proper of um, proper amendments, the um, you know, the proper watering, all that stuff makes your soil enhance your plants. If you have, like I said, if you have bad soil, infertile soil, whatever, it's your your um, plants aren't going to grow. If it's compacted, your plants won't grow. If it's waterlogged, your plants aren't going to grow. Um, so you have to understand your soil in order to know what to plant. So what's the best way to do that? It's soil testing. It's like it says here, a gardener's best friend. And um, the only way to really determine what type of you know, nutrients you need for your soil is to do an actual soil sample. And on the AgriLife website, which I will send in, um, along with the handouts, I will send a whole page of great websites that you can look for information. But one of them will be the um, soil sample website. So you know exactly what you need, you know, how to do a soil sample. When I was in Home Depot the other day, I heard someone giving us um, instructions on how to do a soil sample. And basically what they said was to just take, a, you know, a shovel full of soil, you know, let it spread out and then, um, you know, spread it out on a piece of paper, let it kind of dry out, which is all fine. But they only had one, they told them only to grab one sample of the soil. And so what that means is that um, it, it's going to be an incomplete sampling job. You need to have at least you know, between six and 12 different areas that you've dug up soil from in order to get a good idea of what your soil is really like. So don't just take one shovel full of soil, let it dry out. You need to take um, quite a few shovelfuls, like, you know, and then you let it all dry out, put it in a container that, you know, that you ship off to the um, sampling site. And then you, you, along with the paper saying what you need, and that's all on the, that that's all um, on the website. But the point is, is that 
if you don't have a good sampling um, job, then your data is really not going to be worthwhile. So make sure you get a good sample. And that means taking your samples from all over the yard or the area you're trying to decide. So um, between soil analysis and prep, what's important when you're doing beds um, is adding organic matter to it. Um, when you get a soil sample back, it will tell you like what you're um, like what you're short of, what nutrients you're short of. But if you want to have sustainable growth, if you add organic matter to your soil, that's where you really, that's where your soil is fine. Um, you can, if it's a new bed, you can tell in um, like four inches or so of organic matter. If you till it in, know tilling, know that tilling hurts the microbes in the soil. So if you don't have to till it in, that's okay too, because then you're not hurting all those um, microbes that are already in there. Um, so I only till if I need to, I'll till a new bed only once. And then after that, I just add stuff on top. I never, I never till again. So if you have an area of large trees and grass areas, do you really wanna till all that in? No. If you're adding organic soil matter to the soil, just go ahead and add it to the top because, you know, just lay a nice thin layer um, at the top because otherwise you're going to destroy a lot of roots. And if you are lucky enough to have, a, like, say, a post oak tree in, in your yard, you for sure do not want to be tilling in the area around a post oak tree. Post oak trees have very sensitive roots and they do not want to be, um, do not want to be at all um, messed with. So please don't, don't till around those areas. But it's okay just to add the compost on top of the, um, on the grass, or um, it's also okay to add compost around trees, but not too close. All right, so bed prep for clay soils. And clay is what mostly we have. However, there are bands of sand. So just know Tarrant County soils, we're blackland prairies, but we do have areas that are pretty sandy. And Arlington really, there's a big area in Arlington that has really sandy soil. Um, but you want to incorporate for clay three inches of expanded shale and then three inches of finished plant-derived compost. Um, there's you know, what kind of compost you use. If you compost your own, like use your own um, clippings, your own um, plants from your own yard, that's the best compost you can use because that's what grows in your yard and it's um, also free. So if you have your own compost, that's the best thing to use. Second best thing is um, you can buy compost from the store. Compost is really, really, um, it, it's obvious, like um, you pay for what you get with compost. So a lot of times if it's really cheap, like if it's a dollar a bag, I don't know about the value of that compost. So be really careful about what you're putting down on um, your soil. I know that I've seen those dollar bags that come with their own variety of weed. So be really careful. Make sure you're using high quality compost. So the next part we wanna talk about is actual plant selection. Um, the plants, it matters. I mean, some of, some of us are from the north and there's certain plants we like. Some of us are, have been here forever and there's still certain plants we like. But when we go to a nursery and if we see some of the plants that we grew up in the north and they're still growing here, a lot of times um, they're only here because people you know, have insisted upon getting those plants. So, um, and, and also like if you came from the east. So if you have azaleas in your yard, a lot of times those particular plants are harder to grow because our soils aren't made for it. There's, our soils are more um, alkaline here and azaleas um, prefer more acidic soil. So it's really, it's difficult to grow really healthy azaleas in our area. I'm not saying you can't, I'm just saying it's difficult. And for most of us, it, it's not even worth the, um, the time. For most of us. So what about um, drought tolerant plants? Um, are they just cactus and succulents? Do they have to be just cactus and succulents? No, I mean they can, you can have a beautiful um, yard with native plants, um, native and adaptive plants that are just as drought tolerant as cactus and succulents. And it really that's what we try to teach that it's okay to have the cactus and succulents and it's okay to not have them, so. 
So what drought tolerant plants, they're low water use, um, adapted versus native. I mean, you have to decide what kind works best for you. It's hard to tell, but this um, particular um, picture right here, that's a desert willow, and that is definitely a, a native plant. Um, and a lot of times you can combine uh, the natives with well-adapted non-natives too. So there are some um, non-natives that have adapted really well and also provide sustenance to the cre you know, to the insects and to the critters in our area. Um, most of them don't, but there's quite a few that do help out. So what is a drought tolerant plant? They are plants that have specialized adaptions to handle long periods of drought. Um, some have um, the ability to completely look dead and then all of a sudden just a little bit of water, they'll come, out, they'll come back. Um, the, um, like this, they call them resurrection plants. So this particular plant here, it was pretty much dead looking. And then when they added a little bit of water, it came back alive. And you'll have, you'll see some things um, have a, to um, they handle drought by maybe dropping leaves. They'll handle drought by, um, turning brown like, or go, going dormant the same way, like um, some of our grass, um, buffalo grass or even our Bermuda grass, it will definitely go brown and dormant. And it's not necessarily dead, it looks horrible, but as soon as we get rain, it'll come back to life. So it's one, it's one of their um, adaptations they have to survive. There's also drought avoidance. Um, so this is a Mojave um, aster here. This particular aster, and you might have seen like on um, Animal Plant or some, one at Discovery Channel, one of those, how the, as soon as it rains in the desert, um, these plants come up and then they flower and they immediately, you know, they're doing whatever they can to be pollinated and, and then seed, um, seed heads are formed and then the winds um, push the seeds along, the rain stops, the plants disappear. It was like it never happened. But as soon as it rains again, then the new seeds that were formed from the last plants, they do the same thing. All it needs is a little bit of germination, a little bit of water to, do, to help the germination and off they go. Um, and then um, the last one is, the drought tolerance. So when you think about um, paddle, um, you know, the paddle um, cactus and things like that, they develop um, the drought tolerance by, you know, first of all, like the way their succulents are, um, there's actually two things they do here. Um, you know, they actually hold um, moisture, hold water in like in their paddles or, or they um, have tubers or some type of system in their root system has the ability to hold extra water. And, then they have little um, spines like this. That's so, as I said, talked about earlier, that's so like um, creatures, environments don't come in and just take bites out of their fleshy, um, their, you know, the fleshy plant here and get water from the plant because the plant does not want to be um, eaten. And remember, since they can't move, it's really important that they have um, some type of defense mechanism set up. They're not like they can just, you know, run away from the little mouse that's trying to get, um, water from its uh, plant. But and also another thing that they do, um, plants have the ability to, um, they have with the waxy, um, the, the waxy coating that they have, it actually um, protects it from the sun, helps, um, helps, keeps it from drying the plant out inside. There's, so there's all sorts of different methods. So what type of plants do we use? Um, First and foremost, um, plants that are native to our area are really the easiest plants to grow. Now, some people um, might think that they're just not as pretty, but uh, they're pretty. I mean, there's if you give them just a little bit of water, that might be all they need to be just as pretty as your um, your adaptive plants. Now, there are a lot of hybrids of native, and maybe like a, a, high, a native hybrid might be more what you want, but um, it's, you know, you just, re you're really looking for the native as possible plant. So coneflower is something that there's lots of hybrids now, but this is an, a native plant and it's native to pretty much all the United States. There's different varieties um, that have come out all the time. And I mean, they're beautiful. One thing you want to remember, um, especially with coneflowers is you, want, you need to deadhead these. I mean, not all plants need deadheaded, which means you're taking that, that flower tip off. Um, but the purpose of the plant is to um, seed, and then it, the plant lives on. That's, that's what they want to do. They want to produce seeds they want to live on. So if you keep it from um, 
producing the seeds, then it will keep producing flowers. And then maybe the last thing, like maybe like right before, um, you know, this going to freeze, like maybe in September, you start letting all the seed heads, um, you know, form. So that way it does produce seeds for next year. And it's nice when you get more, you know, more cone flowers for free. You can have, um, and there's a lot of annuals that um, work in our area too that are native and adapted, but you know, and they just add a little, little razzle dazzle to your yard. Um, you don't have to use those. Um, I, you know, I try to use as many perennials as possible because personally, I just don't have a lot of time to work in my own yard. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't enjoy the perennials, I mean, the annuals too. There are perennial verbenias that are native. Um, there's, uh, and just, I mean, look at the gorgeous colors that you can have. There are lots of different types of salvias. Um, salvia gray guy is also called um, autumn sage. There's many names for it. Um, there's quite a few colors in it now. Um, there's also salvia, um, um, the cox, coxin, cox, oh, sorry, I apologize, coxinia. Um, that's always a pretty one. There's um, Augusta Dulberg or Amelie Cup Sage is another one. They're all Salvia Farinesias. This one is Victoria Blue. Salvia Farinesia is a large family. So you're going to, there's many species within this family. Um, one, a broad name is also called Mealy Cup Sage. So there's Victoria Blue, there's Augusta Dulberg, um, there's Henry Duelberg, I mean, there's many. So you might see these all around. A lot of times the difference is height. You know, it will be a lot taller, like the Augusta Duelberg is a much taller, or Henry Duelberg is a much taller salvia than what, say, the Victoria Blue is. And the Victoria Blue has a, a little bit brighter co um, color. And for those looking for less maintenance, um, this is an extremely drought tolerant garden. But it's, you know, it's pretty. Now, this is, has a decomposed granite um, mixture in it, um, but they still have the mulch around. Do you see the mulch right around here? Um, they've used native um, boulders here. And so it gives it a really nice, pretty native look to it. And it's easy. And this is really easy upkeep because you don't have to do anything with it. Um, there's no um, plants that you need to um, hedge, nothing like that. And here's our larger shrub. The um, this is our the regular Texas sage. Now there are bigger ones and smaller ones. Um, Green cloud is probably the the tallest of our Tex our Texas sage. There's um, um, let's see, like a desperado that's a little bit smaller. There's a compact that's a little smaller. But know that they pretty much get get big. Um, some of our wild um, like uh, roses, if you have lucky enough not to have rose rosette around you. That's a good choice for um, drought tolerance. Um, a lot of our ornamental grasses are very drought tolerant. And ornamental grasses are also really good for holding soil in place. So if you have um, like on a hillside or something like that where you've got erosion problems, ornamental grasses hold soil really well because the roots are very, very fibrous. Um, but these are all different native habitats that, um, that we have around the area. And a lot of times, um, if you can add hardscape to different landscapes, the hardscape, you know, the thing with hardscape, you don't have to water hardscape. Um, it doesn't change its shape on you. It doesn't grow on you. So like boulders and things, they're wonderful because um, you can enhance the boulder. You want to make sure it's dug in, though, to make it look natural. But you don't have to worry about fertilizing it. You don't have to worry about mulching it. So Boulders are a good option to add. Um, and, you know, so are like um, paths. You know, paths are always good because you don't want people walking on your um, garden beds. And paths always give people a place to walk. Here's some more um, plants, some native plants. Um, this is these are like primrose here. But see the, and this, the, this is an ornamental tree right here. It's a uh, desert willow. And look at the big, nice boulder right in there. And you see how they enhanced it by putting the flowers around it? It's really pretty. And if the flowers actually start taking over, that's when I use my head shears. I'll just come in and, and chop that back because I want to keep my boulder showing. Doesn't matter. Um, and here's, here's another thing. Um, now, while the um, 
use aren't necessarily native to our area. Um, they're finely adapted. And they're, you know, here we have an, another example of hardscape um, and a nice little ornamental tree here. But this is something that looks pretty in this, it's actually like a um, just coming out in the um, early spring type planting. But you want to have fun, be unconventional, make your landscape yours. You don't have to follow like all these um, rules. I mean, there's there's rules that make sense. Like your eye sees better with ones and threes and fives. You know, with odd numbers, your it works better. But you know add things to your garden that make their garden you. It's kind of like you're inside your house. You know, it's okay to add certain, you know, it's okay to add different structures. Um, if you can see here, right there is um, like a nice little stone bench. Um, but one thing you want to know about this, this has a lot of plants in it, but this is still not a real high maintenance garden because of the mulch that keeps the weeds down, but also, um, what what they're doing here is they're letting things grow to their normal shapes. So the less hedging and things like that you have to do, the less maintenance it is. And also, um, with the um, excuse me, they have their beds defined. They have paths here. Here's your path. If you can actually see the path here. But one thing they've done, and this is really important in in, um, in landscaping, is to have define lines. Um, now things can be outside of the line here and there, that's okay. As long as you have a defined line to let people know psychologically that, you know, this is the border, this is the path, it, it makes the system, it makes your landscape make more sense. All right. Um, and here someone just did a little fun with the, um, with the, um, you know, the way they use the pave stone to make that more interesting. And that's always nice. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and then um, here someone has, um, they they have a running, um, you know, it, this is more of a wet creek bed, but it's not always wet. It's not always, just, it's sometimes it's a lot drier, um, but they have um, the things put up that they need to actually, um, like right here. This helps keep the water back, keeps the soil in, keeps the water back. I mean, it's, it's not meant to be like a waterproof thing because, you know, you want to make sure that water has a place to go. But there's different things that you can do to um, help that kind of thing out. Um, but they also have down at the bottom here, they have different grasses. And this is a Mexican heather um, grass, or, excuse me. But this grass here, what's nice about this grass is that it, um, it's very fibrous um, and it will spread. So know if you have this particular grass in your yard, it will spread. So, I mean, there's that's just one kind, but, it, but if you're trying to control your erosion, it's a perfect thing. A um, lot of things like this you can put in um, your yard. This is a, you know, like a place for lizards. Um, it's warm for them, they like that, so. Um, and so here, this is actually um, something that our, um, I'm so sorry, my, my dog was put away and she got out. <laughs> um, this is actually at our demonstration garden. Our demonstration garden is um, down at the resource center. If you ever had a chance, please feel free to check it out. Um, we love company there. We love guests. Um, you're, it's open from dusk to dawn. There are garden beds that are, you know, people, vegetable garden beds there too. But um, we do have different examples of types of easy to grow plants too. Here you have some muley grass, um, uh, there's dianthus here, there's just different plants. They showed you, here's a, um, a rose that's really quite happy, a climbing rose. Um, but it just gives you an opportunity to look at some different plants that are easy to grow. Um, here is a, a, somebody, um, like a kind of an awkward wall, but it's like how you can just shows you what a raised bed can look like. Um, just different ideas. And once again, they're using grasses and they're using succulents up here. Um, these, these are not watered much at all. They do have a uh, drip system attached to them. Here's another one that shows you just a little different um, ways of using rock and um, stone in your yard. Um, this is actually a project here, um, but this is, we saw this a little bit ago, but this is from a different angle. But if you can see how these um, boulders 
make a nice line and it shows you exactly where um, the creek is. It gives you like, look, there's water here. It's, it's obvious you don't trip and fall into it, but it's all different aspects um, of adding to your landscape to gives it its character. Um, the pretty um, river rock and stuff like here, um, it's just all how, you know, it's built up a little bit. So the water normally sits in this area, but these are the little things that you can do to make your landscape yours. And also the more hardscape you use, the, um, you know, the less, the less plant material, um, the less water you need to use. So there's all sorts of reasons why we like to add hardscape. Um, here's another really nice, um, bed. Now, a lot of times when you see a bed like this in the middle of the yard, it could be because, and we'll get into this in a little bit, um, like rain gardens. Sometimes you have really wet areas in your yard. And one way to handle that is by making, you know, you've tried to grow grass, you've tried to fill in, it's just not working out. So you can actually make it what we call a rain garden. And it's just a lot easier. And we just basically put plants in there that actually grow because it's wet. There's a different angle. Um, these are just different pots, different things people use in their yard. And if you're really creative, there you go. You get some decorative um, different types of planters. Um, here, it's so cute, a little purple fence. Here's a, a pot person. Um, this was actually taken at, uh, I think, um, Mayfest. This was, yeah, this was taken at Mayfest. You can see right behind here. But here is really, really great things you can do around trees. Um, and trees, they, as we've all tried to plant grass around trees and it, it, a lot of times it just doesn't work. But here's different plants, um, but you know, different groupings of plants that around trees, it, it's awesome. I think this design, I'm trying to remember who did this design. Um, it's not at the top of my head right now, I apologize, but um, it's one of my favorites. I, I love how they did it. Um, so here's like, if you have a water, um, if you want a water garden, here's a, a water garden to plants that grow. And there are native plants that definitely grow in water gardens. Um, there's another look at it. Here um, are like, this is in between two driveways. You know, that area in between two driveways, um, it's, you know, where we're, it's, you know, it's hard to water, it's hard to do, you know, it's just hard to keep things alive. So if you go with really nice drought tolerant plants, and uh, um, here they put the Mexican river rock here, it, it's nice, it's pretty, and it's easy. So a, bit, a minute ago, I mentioned a rain garden. A lot of times it's, um, it's a depression, either man-made or it's just has been there. Like that's just what nature has like on the field has made, this is where water's always sat. Um, so if you put in plants that can handle, you know, cause it fills up just for a while until it dries out. And then, um, you know, so the plants are actually made where they can um, work in um, wet and dry. So in what it does, it actually, keeps a lot of that water from growing into the sewer system. So it, like, it, filtrate, it filters the water, um, it takes out the, uh, the impurity. So a rain garden's a great idea um, and they're pretty and you don't have to water them very much because you let nature take care of it when it does rain, unless it doesn't rain, we have that too. So practical turf um, areas, this is the next um, part of the design. What areas should be turf? Um, really, what we try to say is um, no more than a third of your yard should be turf. Uh, that's in order to be truly um, watching our water conservation, you don't want more than a third of it turf. Um, in this situation, you know, they have a lot of trees. So a lot of this might not even last. This is more of a filtered sun. So how much pure sun it's going to get in this particular section it's not gonna be long before there's hardly any sun. So they might eventually have to make this more of a, um, they're gonna end up putting down um, like cover crop, you know, like some like um, some type of vine or, or um, you know, some people use monkey grass, also all sorts of things that grow in the shade. Um, like here is a huge um, yard. Do we need that much yard? And that's what we're trying to think of practical turf areas. We want to make sure that we don't have so much turf because turf takes the most water. It takes the most fertilization. It uses most of our resources. And because a lot of times you have this much turf, you definitely, you like to have it green. So, so when you're talking about turf, 
um, you have to make sure you know um, like where's the location going to be, what's its intended use, um, how much water is it's going to use, and how much maintenance for it. Um, and what variety? There's St. Augustine, there's Bermuda grass, there's Zoysia grass. So you need to know what's the drought endurance, like how much you know dryness can it handle. Buffalo grass is our native grass and it um, can handle a lot. I mean, that's our, that's our best drought plant. Um, common Bermuda grass is next. Um, Zoysia grass um, is right there in the middle. But then as you can see, as it goes on, like um, between St. Augustine and tall fescue grass, those are, they require a lot more water. Now you can train them to try to require less water, but in the end, it, they just require a lot more water. So let's real quick talk about efficient irrigation. Um, in heavy clay soils, um, watering too often will definitely kill the plant. There's nowhere for, I mean, that water just fills in all the air pores and it just drowns the plants. And this happens in your flower beds too. Um, so you want to make sure um, that if in a flower bed, if you have it properly um, you know, taking care of like you, when you built the um, flower bed and you had really good amendments put in, did all the stuff you needed to do, and then you mulched it, then, you know, you hardly have to water. And this is once it's established. No, so anytime you um, plant a plant, drought tolerant or not, you have to give it enough time to establish. And usually that's a couple seasons. So once it's established, you're good. Irrigation systems, um, like, um, Heather said earlier, you can have them in Fort Worth, and I know other cities do it too. You can have someone come out and test your irrigation system. It saves you so much money and it's wor well worth the time and it's free. Um, but you wanna make sure that you know um, what you're watering, how much water it takes. Um, don't have your beds watered at the same time. And what about um, runoff? You know, um, if it's, um, if the type of mulch you use, just water's not, um, going through it, you know, you might need to break up your mulch. Um, if you're on a slope, you know, so there's things you need to consider how long to water and how to water. Um, too much, too often, um, <clears throat> excuse me, all the nutrients just pour out of your soil and that's good, not good. Um, infrequent but thoroughly deep root, you know, infrequent but thoroughly, that's how you water. Um, and how do you know when? Okay, so I know we have certain days that we have to water, but it doesn't mean you have to water those days, like both those days of the week. You can train your yard, you know, to water just one of those days of the week. How do I know when? If you step on it, you see how you see that um, footprint? It leaves a footprint, that's when you need to water. Um, how many times have we seen this? It's, you know, it's, it's the sidewalks are being watered. And one thing I know is that no matter how long you water a sidewalk, it doesn't grow. If you fertilize the sidewalk, it doesn't grow. Nothing causes it to grow, but you can actually ruin it by watering too much also. But your grass and everything can be ruined too. That's not hydrozones. Hydrozones, did I spell that wrong? Um, sorry. Plants with similar watering needs should be grouped together. That's what you really need to know. If it's low watering, you want to be able to put low water there. If it's high watering, you want high water there. Um, so if you're watering trees and shrubs, um, establish plants, um, establishing plants, it takes more water. Established plants take a lot less water. Um, you can get away with once a month watering on established plants. Um, and, but with like watering the lawn, it can never wait that long. I, I mean, it's just, it's just not made for it. Trees, you want to um, make sure you're watering the drip line, not right on the, um, make, not right on the um, trunk. And uh, so you can use a soaker around to uh, trees also. This picture is real. This man is watering these two um, plants, but uh, it's, it's, he has no eyes. He has no, cannot see the big picture. Water efficiency, drip irrigation. Um, Drip is one of the best things that we've ever, um, you know, that we use now. And the um, the ways that, you know, there are drips that you can put under the soil a little bit further, but you always want to have them under the mulch. You don't want to see drip lines ever. Um, but it applies water to soil in a slow manner, and it allows, um, you know, there's you don't have the evaporation, you don't have the um, too powerful misting happening. It's a it's a great way to water each hydrozone efficiently and effectively. So what about irrigation systems? Get to know your irrigation controller. It is your responsibility. You need to know how your controller works. Um, 
I know so many people have no idea how that works, but if you would just, you know, if you don't have the manual anymore, look it up, it's online, I promise. Um, you can add rain sensors to most of them. Um, you also be aware of seasonal schedule changes. So in the summer, you might have, um, you know, your schedule set where you water so much at a time, but in the winter, you don't need that amount of water. You, you just, you know, you're just waterlogging your soils and you're not benefiting them at all. And, um, you know, every so often you have to check your mate, your systems. You have to do maintenance on them. Go through and run, like do a, um, we'll have a two minute test for each zone. Um, run through that, Let's put that on and then walk your zones and see what's happening. Check for um, any type of heads that are broke and stuff that you need to deal with. Um, and also and lastly, um, if you have clay or really shallow soils, you wanna do more of a cycle and soak method. And you might've heard of this. So say you wanna do a, a total, of like say 20 minutes a day on this particular area. So what you, what you need to do is go through and like each zone and maybe water each zone five or 10 minutes, depends, depending upon the size of the zone, and then come back. And then, you know, like say if you did a five minute pre-water, like, you know, Go, you know, quick run through for each of the zones, then you still need 15 more minutes of water on there. So then you set the next cycle for 15. Now, if it's on a slope, you might need to do a third cycle. So maybe you do it like 10, 10, 10, and that keeps the water from um, running over so much. Um, compost once, mulch forever. So mulch, uh, um, it, it does so many things. Um, and if you follow the earth kind methods, um, mulch and when they say compost they also mean like fertilizer if you fertilize everything compost everything put it you know water it all in put a good layer of mulch everything you should only have to um mulch once a year unless your compost i mean unless your mulch is breaking down faster than that maybe you can use little bigger pieces or different kinds of mulch but um you really won't need to keep putting new fertilizers and stuff and i know people find that hard to believe that you don't need to keep fertilizing your things um Unless you're putting like in annuals, you know, and then you're messing all the soil up, then you're gonna have to use um, fertilizer in those areas. But you don't really need fertilizer on your plants if you've already mulched and you keep them mulched. Now, if you're not keeping a mulch, then that changes the whole dynamic. But if you're keeping a mulch, you're all good. Um, and then, you know, you every, once a year, once or twice a year, you just keep, mulch, keep mulching. So what is the value of mulch? It holds down the soil temperature. Um, it controls weed germination. Does it, is it perfect at that? No, because you know why? Birds drop seed, um, you know, seeds everywhere. So they don't care where they drop the seeds. And in Texas, it's windy. So we get um, weed seeds from wind too. So just keep that kind of stuff in mind. Um, and I am gonna put a little note in here too. If you use um, fabric and like the, um, the weed fabric or the weed prevention fabric in your landscape, it is very difficult, um, especially if it's, and I've seen people even use plastic, it's very, very difficult for plants to grow properly with that stuff. Um, it's pretty much, everybody that studied horticulture, we really, really don't like um, those fabrics. Um, it, and now maybe on a, um, what happens is, is that the mulch just slides off of it. Everything slides off of it. So really consider why you're using it or how you're using it. Now, I do use it a lot of times for, if I'm putting, um, like making a dry creek bed, I'll go ahead and use the fabric just to make sure that my, um, my boulders, my rocks and everything don't just disappear into the soil on my client. But, you know, just for your plants and stuff, weeds actually find a way through it and it prevents some of the nutrients from getting underneath it, but it also gives the thing for weeds a chance to hold on to something. So it's really actually harder to get rid of some of the weeds. So think strongly before you use that stuff because it's not always, it, it, it doesn't always look good. And it's usually the first thing you see when someone's used those weed fabrics, like where everything just, like the mulch disappears from that area, it just slides away. Um, oh, and one other thing on this, the aesthetics of mulch. Also, so in the beginning of the talk, I said, um, your house is um, the picture, you know, your house is the most important part. And the, the landscape is like the frame of it all. You know, you're just, you know, your frame should not be the most important part of your, your particular area. It's the picture that's the most important part. So 
when you're using like black mulches, first of all, black mulches are really hot. Um, you, it might not be a good choice, but you're making your landscape more about the mulch because when people drive up a lot of times, um, and I'm talking like the black or the, you know, the, the really black and the really red, those are difficult um, mulches to make work. So, you know, the more like native mulch you can use or cedar mulch you can use, the better it is for your plants uh, because you don't want to make it about the mulch. You want to make it about the house. So real quick, last part, landscape maintenance. This is something that most people, a lot of times they don't even think about when they're working with the, um, their landscapers or, you know, or their designers or even themselves. Um, maintenance can be expensive. So the more um, high maintenance that you have, the more money it's going to cost. So if you have, um, <laughs> Little tigers, they're high maintenance. But if you have a lots of little boxwoods that all need to be, you know, taken care of like that, you're going to have a lot of higher landscape costs. Or you could have, have like a nice little path through the uh, mulched area, taking up more room. You don't have all plants and let things grow naturally. You're going to have a lot less maintenance. So things to um, help you get started: minimize your pesticide use by keeping an idea of what's going on in the yard. If you walk your yard, you can see things happen before they become a problem. Um, fertilize only when it's needed. Um, don't bag your clippings um, and group your water loving plants together and choose the right plants. Use the right tools. So this, you know, <laughs> a spoon might be better here. And you can take the earth kind challenge. It's fun to take. Anybody can take it. And it's fun just to see what your gardening skills and knowledge are. And that's it. And I really appreciate your time today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Great. Oh, no. Thank you so much, Linda. All right, You're it welcome. looks like we have quite a few questions. So we'll go ahead and cover some of them. And, and like I said, if you asked a question today and it's not covered here live with Linda, we will get back to you via email with an answer to your question. Let's see what we've got here. I'm gonna go ahead and um, switch over to my screen so I can put the closing information up. Okay. And so, um, like I said, make sure that you do check your email after you get done with this. I think in about an hour after this ends, it'll send out and that'll be all the information that you need if you wanna pick up a free landscape design kit or if you want to get your go and grow um, garden rebate. All right, let's look at our first questions. Let's see. Um, go from the beginning. Um, someone is asking just for a clarification of where you can get that land, uh, a plot of your land or like a... Oh, oh I think you if you, um, I think Tarrant Appraisal District website has it. So TAD website is where you can find it, a plat survey. Yeah. A plat survey. Or, there or you can, there. so if that's, a, Google it um, for Tarrant County plat survey and it will tell you exactly where to get it. Okay, perfect. Um, and then, yeah, of course, you can also always look at like just Google Earth or whatever, right? right. And um, yeah. get a nice little view of your your home from there, and then you could go from there as well. Um, do you know of any um, design software that is like free online to use or very inexpensive or anything? A few people are asking for different um, software options. Um, that's a, that's actually a little bit tricky, but I, if you don't mind, I'll put some of that in the, in, in the email. I'll have like a follow up in that way. Um, there's more probably for the PCs than Macs, but um, there's also things for like online itself. There are a couple programs that you can use too. I'm not saying if they're good or bad. I'm just saying there are. Yeah, and I think I've seen some online um, that are very basic. Um, right. I I use sometimes just um, Microsoft PowerPoint. And for me, a lot of times for landscape designs, it does really well because I can just make different shapes and then go mm -hmm. ahead and put them in there, you know, however I want. And it's free. <laughs> I already have it. Right. Free is good. Um, but yeah, a lot of those more complicated programs are are pricey and not really for your average um, just home. Right, and, and you're paying for a lot of things you don't need. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, um, 
If you have really hard clay soils and, and not any um, trees or any roots or anything, is it okay to go ahead and till in that compost to break up that hard clay? Yeah. It's fine. It, yeah, because you need to, if you're, um, if you are already compacted, you, you definitely have to do something to break it up. Um, and that's where even in your, your grass, if you have extra money in your budget, I mean, if you could spend, honest to goodness, like, at least a quarter to a third of your budget on um, making your soils right, you, you'll you benefit so much more in the long run. So, you know, think about that. Um, and you can put expanded shell, till that in, even in the grass area. But if you have post oaks, you cannot do that. It will destroy your trees. Okay. Other trees, you know, just don't go really close to the tree, but. Um, right, right. Okay, and a follow up on that: If you aerate your yard, do you then top dress that compost on Good top? Good question. Of that? To, uh, that is a great yes. That is the best thing to do. So if you aerate your yard, make sure you use the kind of aerators that um, have plugs that come out. Don't use the spikes. Um, you can use the spikes, but really you're just compacting it more. I mean, you're just mm -hmm. they're just moving the soil around. So if you can use the kind that has spikes, I mean, excuse me, uh, that has plugs. Uh, then go through, and you don't have to take the um, dirt plugs away, you can leave them, but then go through and top dress with a good compost. That's a great idea. Okay, perfect. Um, do you have any recommendations for shade tolerant grasses, shade tolerant St. Augustine's, or like if St. Augustine can't grow, are you pretty much grass isn't going to happen there? Right. If you can't, so St. Augustine is our most shade tolerant. Um, grass. And so I know there was a couple years back, a few years back, there was a commercial. It guaranteed, this grass is guaranteed to grow anywhere. Well, it's a lie. It won't grow anywhere. You have to have, in our most shade tolerant plant, at least four hours of direct sunlight. That doesn't mean four hours of um, partial shade. That means direct sunlight. So mm -hmm. if you're not getting that, then you're not going to grow grass. And it may grow in patches, but it's not going to grow um, thick and lush, and it's always going to be stressed. And so what happens to stressed grass? Stressed grass opens itself up for insect and disease issues. And it, with St. Augustine, that's like a given. You know, you're going to have insect and disease issues. So be really careful if you're not getting that. You know, having, I mean, if someone asked me to lay grass in an area that I look up and see two huge live oaks, um, I, I'm going to tell them I won't do it. And mm -hmm. They can find someone that will do it, believe me, but I'm not going to be, I'm not doing it because it's just going to waste their money and I, I can't do that. So right. there's that. So no, there is not anything out there. So you'll have to use, um, there's different ground covers you can use. Um, if you, I think on um, native and adaptive plants um, brochure that you uh, you have connected to the um, to the talk today, mm -hmm. it has different ground covers and some for shade, some for um, you know, sun, and also things like um, the tall mondo grass, you know, people will actually plant that and let it grow. Now, the tall mondo is, you know, they let it grow and then they, they actually mow it. Um, grows faster than the short mondo grass, like the dwarf mondo grass takes forever. Um, and it gets very expensive. So, you know, mm -hmm. but there are ways that you can use that and fill in areas, but there's just, you know, you can, and honest to goodness, trees hate plants around them. So they will do whatever they can to kill the plant that's around them. It's not just a black walnut. Trees do not like um, to, to share their nutrients. So just there's that too. It's not necessarily you could be a mean tree. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And that's true. There are certain types of trees where you're just not going to get anything to grow around it because it doesn't want it to grow around yeah. it. Um, yep. But like you said, St. Augustine really is a, a, a needy grass and um, one of the, like, like you said, it uses a lot of water, but it's also really susceptible to, to insects and disease compared to some of our other more hardy right. grasses. But, Especially um, if it's stressed. Right. Um, but I think also the Texas A&M AgriLife website you can go to and look at some of those different grass varieties yes. on there and see if there are some, um, some of those proprietary <laughs> varieties that might work out a little bit better. Yes. Um, okay. Whenever you're planting next to the house, how do you handle that drip line and like the runoff from the house if you don't have um, gutters? That is a great question too. Okay. So one thing I do a lot, um, first of all, 
I don't like my plants that close to a house. So you want to plant them out a little bit anyway. But if it's a really big issue and like you can put mulch behind the plant, and you know, the mulch can, you know, help with the drip. But you have to make sure that your soil is facing, is, is such a way that it goes away from the house. And a lot of times I like to make dry creek beds in that area. Like it kind of goes behind the plants and comes out in a different area. just kind of something really pretty. Um, but if it's a, if you're having foundation issues, like in, in other, you need to make sure that um, you're not hurting your foundation by not having gutters. Um, gutters are really a, a good way to save your foundation. So, you know, if you don't have them and you can afford it in your budget, it's something well worth looking into. But in the meantime, if it's not something that you can do, whatever, go ahead and, um, you know, you can use rock back there and make it a pretty rock, not just, you know, pretty, you can put a pretty rock by the, or make sure you just have um, mulch back there. Something, you don't want it to hit regular soil because then dirt splashes everywhere and it, it as you know, it erodes it away. So you want to have it protected, but that, that's stuff you can do. And, you know, pull your plant out far enough where it's not hitting the plant directly. Okay. Um, all right, if someone doesn't have a landscape or an irrigation system yet, do you recommend planning the landscape before the irrigation system is planned? So that really depends upon, so if you're doing it everything yourself, um, okay, first of all, irrigation, if you're doing it yourself is one thing, and there's some really good websites on teaching people how to do proper irrigation, but it, there's a lot involved. Um, but if you have someone else on your yard to help you with irrigate, irrigation, they have to be licensed in the state of Texas. Yes. Uh, and there's many reasons for that. And what, a lot of it is, you know, there's, you have to understand, um, you know, the best like water rate, you have to understand how far you can, you know, each of the irrigation heads can spray, um, how not to mix them or how to mix them. You wanna make sure that you completely understand what's going on. Um, as I said, there are great websites for it, but if you're doing it yourself, but if anybody comes on your property doing irrigation, it has to be done by someone that's licensed, not just a professional, but licensed. And there, I mean, there's school involved and there's, there's tests involved. So, mm -hmm. but, um, so do I recommend doing the landscape first or the no, irrigation the first? Design first before the, that irrigation. So I would have a design first make an idea of how you want it to go. And then you can go ahead and have the irrigation people go ahead. So, and this is where it gets tricky. If you're doing all drip irrigation, um, and before you like, say if you're gonna have irrigation even on the grass, you want, you have to have the irrigation in before you can do the grass. Now, when you're digging in the soil and all that kind of stuff, um, you that, that just depends upon the irrigator and the landscaper. You know, I would prefer, um, I would prefer they actually put the irrigation in um, and the, even in the beds and then I just pick it up and move it and then I plant and then I unhook the things and put, put everything back together. I, it's just easier for me, you know, but, and it's easy, that way they, they don't have to come back. Like they'll have one part done and have to come back to the other. It might be easier for the client, but it really comes down to what your irrigator and landscape designer decide. You I mean, you could work with them, but it depends on who's doing what, but I definitely would have a plan done so you know where your beds are going to be and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. At least like a rough plan, right, to know where your landscape beds are going to be versus where your lawn is going right. to be. Different um, so amounts of water. Yeah, to di different types of heads and different amounts of water mm -hmm. that you might be doing. Okay, let's see. We've got some more. Do you have any recommendations for good um, shrubs to put out front as like a, a foundation you know how people kind of like to have shrubs out front of their house for a nice um, yeah so they're keeping that's a really good question because um landscape is you know it's evolving people are finally realizing we don't really need foundation shrubs like they had before you don't need a line of straight line of shrubs in front of your house anymore um mm -hmm. that's not how nature really is i mean so they're pulling the landscapes out and they're much prettier and more, um, I don't know, more exciting now. Um, like there's some in, sometimes you'll have people that will replace um, shrubs that have died on you and they'll replace it with something that's like, they don't read the label and it's, you know, they'll put in front of a window, a plant that actually gets 10 feet tall when all you want it was a plant that gets two feet tall. 
because there's different varieties of the same plant. So if you ever heard of the plant like Lorepedalum, it's a purple leaf plant. It's got little pink flowers on it. It's a cute, pretty, you know, cute plant. Um, there are so many different varieties of that plant. There's some that get one and a half feet tall, and there are some that make nice little trees. So you have to have you know, you have to read the label. Now, I'm not saying a plant always reads its label because sometimes it'll grow much larger than what the label says, but you have to have an idea. So if a plant is supposed to get 10 feet wide by 10 feet tall, you can't put that right against your house because it's, gets 10 feet wide just to start with. So that doesn't right. mean the 10 feet's all to the front. It means 10 feet from the center, like, or I mean, five feet on each, you know, from the center all right. around. So make sure it's out far enough. And so a list of those plants, um, you can always go to, um, also Water University has a top 100 list. And is I think you might have some of the plant, um, information that you have given them, uh, We'll have that information too on it. But you can look in books like Neil Sperry's books, um, uh, Howard Garrett has a book, and then there's um, Native Plants for Texas, Native Plants for North Texas, things like that. And you look at those kind of things and decide to help you get a good idea of what plants will work. But pay attention to what the plant's normal, you know, what's how big does it get when it's done growing? You don't want a plant that you're gonna have to constantly work at. That's the maintenance part that you want to keep down. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, and then someone is asking, can you go entirely drip irrigation if you want? Yes, definitely. It's definitely possible. And in fact, um, it's, you know, as long as it's, first of all, it's easy to fix. If drip irrigation springs a leak, it's easy to fix. And it's easy to tell where it's at. Um, but you definitely can go entirely, entire drip irrigation. The one thing you want to be concerned about is to make sure there's just enough hoses, you know, like enough runs. Mm -hmm. for, um, and there's, and that there, there are, you know, standards, things that, you know, you don't want it this far apart or, you know, any more than this far apart, stuff like that. Um, and, and that's important to pay attention to, but, you know, don't, you know, understanding how the, you know, how much water is put out is important. Um, but mm -hmm. there's no reason why you can't handle drip irrigation for the whole for your whole entire yard. Yeah, absolutely. And we've got some videos on safeterrawater.com that you can go view that talks about how to convert. Like if you have an existing system, there's a spray irrigation and you want to convert, you know, um, a zone or two to drip. We've got some videos about that as well. So definitely check out our website yes. if you want to see more about how to do that yourself. Um, all right, so I think that that wraps it up. There are a few more questions, but a lot of those questions are actually about the um, some of the resources that we've been talking about. So we'll just make sure to send out some of those resources um, with the follow-up email, and uh, we'll let everyone know more information about the soil test that you talked about and how you can get that conducted, um, and then a little bit more information, it looks like, as well, about um, some of these irrigation things. I can send out some links to some videos that we have, and then... Great. Also, we'll just send out a few more resources about like the Texas Smart Skate system and some of these systems where you can look up um, some appropriate plants. All right, so um, thank you so much, Linda, for sharing all of your wisdom with us tonight and um, answering all those questions and everything. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight and hearing about landscape design. And um, like I said, go to safeterrawater.com to take a look at some other events that are going to be happening in the future. We've got next Tuesday a spring vegetable gardening class that we'll be doing. So make sure to tune into that. And um, thank you again, Linda, and everyone have a great night. All right. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye.